So it's my pleasure uh, to be here and my honor. Um, I actually come, I, I, I'm part of your guys' lineage. Uh, I was the finance chair for the year 2000 of PAMSA National Conference 15 years ago. <laughs> And so recently I moved out of my house and I was going through things and I found the program from that year and oh my God, things have changed since that time, right? Uh, but as, as things have changed, things have also stayed the same. And that theme of intersections in healthcare, believe it or not, actually was in play in 2000, but things have, th things have caught up to where we are now. In, in other words, we have a more diverse group of people practicing medicine in this country. We have a more diverse patient base. We have better technology and better application of technology than we, than we uh, did back in 2000. I mean, literally in 2000, I, I was sitting around with some of my friends and saying, wouldn't it be really cool if we could like get internet through the air? <laughs> and like get it on these things like that look like tablets? Wouldn't that be really cool? Um, so, you know, here we are now, we're at this, this amazing era of healthcare, and um, the subtitle I gave for this talk is, is Playing to Win. And, and it's not about individual winning, it's about winning for our patients. It's about winning for, for the communities that we serve. Because what we know is that they aren't being served in the ways that we think they need to be served. And, and certainly, uh, as you enter medical school, you come in with a, a vision for what you want to accomplish, and then what you realize when you, when you get out of medical school and into residency training is that things are not as idealistic as you'd like them to be, but it doesn't mean that you can't change things. So we must play to win for our patients. So these are some of the learning objectives today um, and, and some of the high points that we're gonna hit. So it's about understanding the context of today's healthcare system. We're in a tremendous period of change. Um, Kim had mentioned that I went to Stanford and uh, I was there in the early 90s and again I had one of those aha moments or duh moments where I was like who's going to use email? Like I, I got an email account and I was like who's going to use this? I'd rather go down the hall, write on someone's chalkboard because we didn't have dry erase boards back then <laughs> and, and uh, you know I'd rather do that and so I missed that Silicon Valley boat, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, in healthcare today, we're seeing uh, a tremendous amount of innovation happening. And so that means there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for all of you to consider not only how can I be the best doctor that I can be, but how can I be the best doctor with skills in tech, doctor with skills in public health, doctor with skills in business. These are all things that are going to be re really critical. Um, next, I'm going to outline some key changes needed to make health primary. Dr. Murthy referred to this about prevention being more, sort of a better use of our resources than cure. And I think there are things that we clearly need to work on in the healthcare system to make health front and center uh, rather than treatment of illness. We're going to meditate on the triple aim plus one. Um, and the plus one is something that I've added, um, but it's also been written about in the literature as the quadruple aim. And we'll, we'll kind of hit that a little bit later on. Um, we're going to envision what the future of healthcare will look like. And, um, you know, healthcare is going to look very different uh, in 10, 25 years from now than what it looks like now. We may go from a period of time where people are just popping pills to we might be using devices and apps to help treat patients. Um, so we don't know what the future is going to look like, but we're certainly going to, we want to be prepared for that. Along those lines, uh, the workforce is going to be really critical. And that's ju not just the workforce in terms of sheer numbers, but it's how the workforce applies its skill to the treatment of patients and to the prevention of illness. That's really going to matter. And those models are changing as we speak. Um, and that actually highlights a workforce problem, meaning not only do we not have enough people working in healthcare, uh, i.e. physicians, we don't have the right distribution, we um, also certainly don't necessarily prepare ourselves well for the future. Um, and we're not really known as a progressive industry. We're not like Facebook. We're not like Google. Uh, we're, we're a very different type of beast. And so um, uh, some of that change is going to come from, from all of you. And then finally, recognizing the opportunity and responsibility we all share for leading that future. 
So, 100 plus years ago, uh, this individual, Abraham Flexner, uh, is pretty much wrote a report that's very much responsible for our siloed way of teaching medicine to people. This is the reason why we have specialties. This is the reason why it, uh, healthcare can often feel fragmented. It, on, on, the, on the upside, I think it really advanced science uh, because we, what, what was very much embraced with Flexner was science being at the core of what we do. And so I love this quote, science in the very act of solving problems creates mo more of them, right? And um, what we have today is a very regimented way of, of teaching medical students in an environment that's changed very much uh, since the days of Flexner. And so there's some tension there. So a couple weeks ago, I was actually sitting on this stage with a small group of first year and second year students from UCI uh, for an elective on social medicine. And clearly there's a thirst and a hunger for getting additional information that your curriculum, that your curricula are not providing you in medical school. Now I think medical schools have certainly gotten better at that, but uh, that's, only become, that's only become part of the landscape because students like you have demanded that of, of schools and have asked for it. And I think schools have realized we, we need to better prepare our students for the future. And so, um, sadly, we, we haven't really gotten away from Flexner, um, and, and in many ways it's gonna be difficult to get the escape velocity necessary to, to move into this more innovative uh, sort of mindset. But, um, again, uh, you know, we're, we're in a very interesting period of time in healthcare, so I wanna provide some context for that. So, Practicing medicine in the United States, for the most part, I can tell you it's a non-system. There are systems of care, they're not very well tied together. Okay, so we have uncoordinated and fragmented care, and there are efforts up front um, from all of the organizations that are represented here, uh, all of the grown-ups in the room that, that, that are um, out, out practicing in the world. We're all working towards trying to make it more coordinated and less fragmented, okay? But it, it takes a lot of effort because there are forces in play that are, that are making it very difficult for us to do that. The current health system uh, certainly emphasizes intervention uh, rather than prevention. Again, Dr. Murthy uh, uh, related to this. And um, we also don't really focus on comprehensive management of care, uh, of health. We have a lot of specialists who focus on the right elbow or the left ankle or the right kidney. Um, uh, but we don't have a lot of general contractors who are kind of involved in ensuring that the entire house looks okay, right? So if we have a bunch of plumbers, we're gonna end up with a lot of plumbing, right? And then we also know that costs are, are unsustainable and are continuing to rise. Um, the access is declining, uh, that is until the Affordable Care Act came along. So people now have a card uh, uh, or are eligible to get a card. And we also know that quality is still kind of slippery we have process measures that look at whether or not we're doing certain things that are important for health, but we don't really know in the metrics that we receive on a day-to-day -day basis, are we prolonging people's lives? Are we truly making quality of life better? And so these are big questions, and I think, again, a challenge and opportunity for your generation, along with other generations represented in this room, to really make a difference. So before the Affordable Care Act, this is, the, this is what we were dealing with in this, in this country. We had 50 million uninsured patients, equivalent to um, the populations of those states or the population of those countries that you see up on the screen. And what we know is that insurance coverage is only part of the solution. So back when I was in college, and tell me if you can relate to this, I um, uh, received, I paid for a parking permit and when I purchased the parking permit from the parking lady, I said, yeah, I got a parking permit, awesome. And what she said to me was, honey, that's just a hunting license. It doesn't guarantee you a parking spot. It just means that once you find a spot, you can park in it and you're okay. And just make sure it's, it's, it's not an A spot, it's not a B spot, it's a C spot, because you're a student, so you get C parking, right? So, um, so likewise in healthcare, we can give people a card to go see a doctor, but what if there aren't enough doctors to be seen, those patients? So when I was in Massachusetts, uh, getting my master's in public health, I worked in urgent care, 
And I worked the 7P to 7A graveyard shift on a Friday night because I was married at the time and my wife lived here in Southern California and I had nothing better to do than work. <laughs> and what, so I could pay for the airplane flight to come back to see my wife. I, it's not that sad, trust me. <laughs> um, and um, it was remarkable because what would happen at two in the morning is I would get the uh, chief complaint here for my medication refill on a Friday night. And in my typical Southern California self, I would say, dude, what are you doing here? It's two in the morning on a Friday. Well, the bar's just closed and I need a refill on my hypertension medicine. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about that. <laughs> uh, you know, are you, uh, do you need an eye opener? Uh, do, you need, do you feel like you need to cut back? Uh, do you get angry when people ask you these questions? Uh, but the other piece of this was, you know, why are you coming to me at two in the morning on a Friday asking for a medication refill? Well, the guy says to me, well, it's because I couldn't get an appointment to see my primary care doctor. You know, I got a card, but I, I can't see my primary care doctor. It's three, four months down the road. Access was terrible, even though you had access, right? So um, we're seeing stories like that play out in other markets across the country. And certainly, the last two years, uh, I, I'm a primary care physician. Our office has gotten inundated with chief complaint, I haven't seen a doctor in 10 years. And then um, they bring in a book of, this is what I need to be, have addressed in my 15 minute visit today, okay? So it's hard out there right now. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of issues around, um, not only giving people a card, but also getting them connected with the right person or the, or the right team to help them with their health. So this is an older slide, but it, it's there to emphasize a point here, which is that um, primary care, uh, there's a lot of shortage in this country. It's uh, a lot more evident in areas that are less populated. So rural areas certainly uh, suffer more than urban areas. Um, and you also see that the middle of the country suffers more than the coasts, okay? And then if you were to remove family physicians from that mix, you would see that those areas of red get even darker, uh, get more intense. So, you know, there's clearly an opportunity here for us to look at not only, you know, we can't grow primary care doctors overnight. You just, you don't just add water and create a family doctor or a primary care physician, it's four years of medical school, three years of, three years of postgraduate training, right? The so seven years, that's a long sort of tail in order to get someone to grow up to be a primary care doctor. So we have to think differently about how we prepare that workforce. And I'll, get, I'll hit that a little bit later on. So we do know that states that rely more on primary care um, have lower spending, have lower resource inputs, have lower utilization rates, and, and by, by today's measures, have uh, what appears to be better quality of care, okay? And uh, what, what I can tell you about that is patients, um, some, sometimes very, in a very unsolicited manner, will say to me, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm at home when I come here because the front office staff greets me, you, you, you hug me when you see me, I won't let you treat my diabetes until you show me new pictures of your kids. Um, you know, this, this is like a home. And, and when we signed up to be physicians, that's kind of what a lot of us imagined that we would be, is that longitudinal, relational-based medicine, uh, that, that rather than sort of a transactional uh, type of picture. So we also know that um, there's increased access with, with primary care. Uh, better focus on prevention, uh, proactively supporting patients with chronic illness, and engaging self patients in self-management and decision-making. And I'm not saying that this is all on primary care, because I know a lot of specialists who, ha who have the same mindset, um, but what I am saying is that patients should come to expect that of their primary care physician and their, and their primary care provider. So we know that the key elements of a high-functioning healthcare system, you gotta get coverage. So we're getting there, right? The Affordable Care Act is insuring more people. We want patient-centered medical home for every patient. And what that, what that means is we're not gonna build a home for every single patient, although in some parts of the country, that's literally what they're doing. So like in Denver, the way they treat homelessness is to put people in housing. 
Because what they realize is those patients keep getting readmitted to the hospital, and it costs the system a lot of money. So you can think upstream about how to uh, fix these issues. And that healthcare is really a shared responsibility um, of, every, of all the stakeholders that are out there, because it can't be just on the doctors. It can't be just on the nurses. It can't be just on the people in suits uh, in the, the C-suite you know, at a health system. It's got to be everybody. And it's got to be something that goes beyond the four walls of an office or a hospital. And we have to talk about this in terms of the, of the greater community context of, of the population and that ecology. So along those lines, I, the argument I'm trying to make here is that, that we really need to reinvigorate uh, primary care in this country and, and the infrastructure. And even if you choose not to be a primary care doctor, Work well with primary care, because what you'll find is that your patients will be better served by working well together rather than working apart in different silos in that flexinarian model. We need to break down those silos in order to be able to better care for those patients. We really need to redesign the manner of healthcare delivery in this country. Um, think about the power of FaceTime. And I'm not paid by Apple. <laughs> but think about the power of FaceTime. Um, I know a family physician colleague who travels around the world, and he makes it a point to round on his patients, even though he might be in Germany. And the way he does that is he gets up on FaceTime, and he talks with his patients on the phone, and talks with the hospital team, and, and catches up with them. And it's a total relational thing, and he, I, don't, I don't know if he bills for it, and if he does, great. If he doesn't, that's sad. But, <laughs> But the point is, he does it because he cares, right? Um, and it, likewise, when I'm on the road, uh, and I'll be in Denver this coming week for a meeting, um, I will be checking in on my patients. I have somebody in hospice right now. I will be calling that patient probably two or three times during the week, not because I'm going to get paid a copay or whatever. It's, be, it's because I care, and it's because that I feel like that's my moral obligation to the patient. And it gives me joy. It gives me a sense of joy. and. Uh, you know, that I'm actually making a difference in someone's life. So we need to support that feeling in all of you as you go out, because we know that physician burnout is a big issue these days. All right, so let's talk about the triple aim plus one. The gentleman that's pictured with me here is Don Berwick, and he's sort of the father of the triple aim, okay? Um, and what the triple aim is better health, better experience, better value, and that fourth aim is really around your joy in practice. Are we supporting the values that you wrote about in your personal statement to allow you to practice the kind of medicine that you envisioned for yourself and, and, and with each other for the future? And otherwise, if we're not talking about joy, what better health, better experience, better value feels like to doctors is people in suits telling you what to do which is kind of the, where, where we're at right now. And so we need to push back a little bit and say, OK, I didn't sign up to click on a bunch of buttons. In my personal statement, I, I did not write, I want to grow up to be a physician so I can click on a bunch of buttons to feel meaningful uh, so that I can meet meaningful use criteria. Um, I did not, <laughs> you know, no one, no one wrote that in their personal statement. And if you did, talk to me later. We'll, we'll, we'll have a conversation. <laughs> But more or less, people, what people wrote about was, I, you know, what I really want to do is I want to make a difference in people's lives. I want to make people healthy. I want to be there uh, you know, at, at a patient's birth. I want to be there at the end of life. I want to be there with multiple generations of, of, of a family. My guess is that's probably what you guys wrote about. So uh, what is the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act? This is what healthcare reform is. And by and large, what it's been is uh, additional coverage for patients, right? It's, it's expanding insurance coverage. Now, what I think it's also done and I don't, is it's also triggered this new age of innovation that we're seeing uh, in the marketplace. And certainly, my health system, which is not that far away from here, Memorial Care, we've been talking about innovation in ways that we've never talked about innovation before. And it's largely because we realize we have to be competitive. Otherwise, we, um, you know, the 800-pound in the room is, is Kaiser in, 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 in California, right? And um, we're, all, we're all trying to compete with Kaiser. 
We may not be able to compete on size. We may not be able to compete on clinical quality, but perhaps there are other areas that we can compete on, right? So I like to think of Memorial Care as the Trader Joe's to, um, you know, the Ralph's or Albertsons or Safeway <laughs> that, that Kaiser is. You know, they both provide similar goods and services, but they've got different personalities, right? And so, uh, and what you'll find is as you go on your job search, uh, as you're leaving uh, medical school and residency, you're going to be confronted with some of these choices because there's a lot more choice now uh, than, than, there, than there, there might have been in, in the past in terms of types of practice. So no relation to me. <laughs> a goal is, is not always meant to be reached. It often serves simply as something to aim at. So the triple aim, it's sort of the holy grail, right? If you talk to people about, you know, what are you doing to achieve the triple aim? They might tell you a few things. Or what does it look like when you've achieved triple aim? They, they, might, they might have some vision of what that might look like. But they'll probably have a hard time elucidating exactly what operational mechanisms need to happen, what business processes need to get you to get there. This is something that we're all struggling with right now in, in healthcare. We're trying to figure out how to achieve that, but none of us really knows how to do that just yet. So what does this mean for you as a medical student or resident? It means that you are training at a very pivotal time, and I've, and I've said this multiple times. This is a golden era. You know, you may have people telling you, yeah, forget about medical school you should go into tech or whatever. But this is a golden era. You're entering at a, a very fascinating and innovative and interesting time. It means that you have a responsibility to be a change agent. Um, and what that means is um, you need to convert your passion for making change happen to, go, to going from, so back in 2002, I was in Washington, or no, I was in Houston with uh, American Medical Student Association and I, we protested in front of the Enron building, and I wrote Healthcare for All on my chest. <laughs> and I thought at the time, damn, I'm making a difference, <laughs> right? I even made the local news affiliate on television, right? I gotta digitize it one of these days and, and throw myself under the bus. But what you realize is that that passion and the writing the Healthcare for All on your chest, that really doesn't make a difference. It might make you feel like you did something, but the truth is, sometimes you gotta, get, you, you gotta be at that table, right, to really make that difference and, and to create real change. So it's about being passionate, but it's about channeling it in a way that's gonna be effective and meaningful. And I'm learning a lot from watching um, House of Cards about how to be influential, <laughs> except I haven't killed anybody yet, so, um, so we're good yet. Uh, <laughs> so our colleague, uh, Dr. Seuss, uh, once said, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better, it's not. And think about what drove you to, to be here in the seats that you're at today and into the, to pay lots of money to go to school or to borrow lots of money to go to school. It's because you care a whole awful lot and you want to make a difference. And that's really the only way we're going to get things to change. It's not us being victims. It's not us allowing for things to not change, because that's abdicating our responsibility and our moral duty to our patients and our communities. So Master Yoda once said, do or do not, there is no try, okay? So meaning, we shouldn't try, we should just do it, right? And so that means scrubbing the healthcare for all off my chest and then figuring out a real way to make a difference. So what we're in the middle of is evolution. It's a cottage industry of small independent providers that, you know, back in um, even, say, before, when APAMSA was formed in the mid-90s, you could probably say that this is kind of what the healthcare industry was like. Managed care had started to creep in, and, and that was the first phase of corporatization and integration of, of healthcare in this country. And now, with the second wave, with the Affordable Care Act, we're seeing a lot of integration and, and um, you know, vertical integration, horizontal integration, you'll hear these terms bandied about. Um, but, and, and even more so now, we have, a, we have a responsibility to speak up as physicians. Uh, more so than we did back in the 90s, and I would say um, uh, it's really critical that we do now because otherwise business decisions are gonna be made without us in the room. And that, that's a real problem for our patients. So if you're not at the table, 
you're on the menu. And I don't want to be on the menu. Who wants to be on the menu here? Who wants to be at the table? Okay, you guys don't seem like you're that sure. Who wants to be, a, who wants to be at the table? Raise your hand. Who wants to be on the menu? Okay, if you want to be on the menu, talk to me later. We'll have a conversation about how, how, how to not put you on the menu. So, um, it sounds sort of silly, but we, we kind of have to be revolutionary, okay? We have to be, we have to think along these lines, and again, not because we're going to, you know, go to our local hospital and burn it down and take over the CEO's office, right? Not in that sense, but it's about pushing back. It's about standing up for what we think is right. And what we do know is that creating force requires mass times acceleration. And this day and age, it's about amplification. So how many of you guys know that the hashtag for today's conference is hashtag, hashtag UCI of PAMSA 2015? How many of you guys know that? Okay, how many of you guys are tweeting right now as we speak? Okay, one person. <laughs> so um, you guys have a voice, right? It doesn't have to be the healthcare for all, right? Um, it can be 140 characters or less with a hashtag. That's a voice, right? And um, you'll hear a little bit later on about social media and, and advocacy, but using your voice, uh, you know, f let me give you a really good example. The vaccine debate in this state, uh, we, we had a big controversy about SB 277, hashtag SB 277. There was a lot of discussion that went on behind the scenes that wasn't at the Capitol that influenced the policymaking up in Sacramento. And it's because family physicians, pediatricians, other advocacy groups got together to fight on behalf of science and vaccines won because SB 277 became law, right? So that's just an example of how you can amplify your message by coming together with even just 140 characters or less and create some force in the system. So um, I developed some rules of Family Medicine Revolution Fight Club. And these are um, based on, loosely, on uh, you know, uh, Fight Club's rules, right? But the bottom line is, that is rule number one and rule number two. You must talk, tweet, and Facebook post about FM Revolution Fight Club, okay? Rule number two is you must talk, tweet, and Facebook posts about Family Medicine Revolution. Now pick your hashtag, right? SB 277, uh, the pediatricians have their, their, they call themselves tweetiatricians uh, on, in, in Twitter. Um, it's really cute, right? Um, but but the, the point is that we're all out there in that space trying to make a difference, trying to be a voice of reason, trying to be the voice of physicians that are out there, trying to counteract the misinformation that's out there. And if we're not out there, who else is going to be out there? Then we're on the menu, not at the table. So I think this is really important to point out that we have represented in our workforce and, and in, in this room four different generations of healthcare workers, right? And it's really critical to understand that each of those generations and respect what they bring to the table, okay? You have a certain amount of, of panache and, and things that you bring in as a representative of your generation. You know, I'm a Gen X, although I, I, I have characteristics of Y, so I call myself Gen XY. Um, there's, <laughs> there's the baby boomers and there's the traditional generation, right? And so each of those generations brings something to the table. And I would say in healthcare, historically what we've done is we said, you will not be a leader until you get a certain amount of gray hair on top of your head. And that is rapidly changing as we speak. Um, at the organization where I work and in the organization where a lot of my colleagues work, people in the Gen X generation are saying, we need to be part of the conversation. And um, people are listening because we're speaking up. And likewise, I would say for your generation, you need to speak up and say, we want to be part of that conversation. We want to be at the table. We don't want to be on the menu, okay? And I love this quote because it's, it's about the ones, we're, that we are the ones that you've been waiting for. 
Every generation kind of feels that, right? So act on it. Make it happen. Don't, don't just get all involved in your books. You've got to be outside the books and, and think about how you can make a difference. And there's the value partnership in uh, not only with our patients, but with other allies as well. And so, um, you know, I, I referred to the vaccine debate, and we had kind of what's called a cognitive coalition, a coalition of, of people who are in the cognitive sciences who banded, who banded together to help move forward that policy. So we need to find our allies and our friends and realize that we don't have to do it all ourselves. So let me give you a really good example. About 10 years ago, actually longer than that, about 12 years ago, um, we started to offer voter registration in, in uh, our medical office. And um, I got invited by the LA County uh, Registrar Recorder uh, to go and uh, give a, 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 a talk. Uh, his name's Dean Logan. You can follow him on, on Twitter and Instagram and on, on Facebook. He's pretty active. And uh, so I got invited to this meeting and I said, okay, I'll show up. And I figured there'd be like, you know, 15 people you know, uh, at this meeting. And I walk in, and there's 100 people in the room. This is the community voter committee. And um, Dean didn't prepare me. He said, oh, we have a special guest. Dr. Lee, you have the floor. <laughs> and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> I don't know what to say. And what I did is I got up and I said, I'm a doctor. I don't know anything about voter registration. I need your help. Because I, don't, I am a doctor. I, I don't know how to register people to vote. Right? So I needed help. I needed an ally. And so out of that came, um, you know, we had uh, like a fair that was, uh, you know, where they did some um, bone marrow uh, screening, and then right next to it was a voter registration booth. So we were able to kind of make those things happen. Now, I haven't been as involved lately, but I think that's a really good example of how people in healthcare and people in other industries or people in other disciplines can work together to make a difference. Because really, when a patient comes to you and says, yeah, you know that diet and exercise thing you're writing in my chart? I'd really like to be able to do that, but I work two jobs, and by the time I get home, I'm going to get shot in the neighborhood or stabbed in the neighborhood if I go play, you know, work out in the park. And good luck trying to find fresh produce, doctor. Have you been to one of the stores in my neighborhood? I had a patient literally tell me this, and I was like, are you registered to vote? Because <laughs> I... I I couldn't write that on a prescription and fix that, right? This, this, this had to be something bigger than me, bigger than my clinic to be able to fix that. And so what he did was he, he said, yeah, I'm registered to vote. I said, well, this is, this is your city council person. Go out and talk to them. And he, and he felt like he was heard. Now, things have improved slightly in that neighborhood, um, but the most important thing for that patient was that he felt like he was heard. He was heard by his doctor, and he was heard by his city council person all because we talked about diet and exercise, right? I love this quote because we are living it right now. The best way to predict the futures is to invent it, okay? So how many people know what this is? <laughs> this is gonna be like a generational thing. <laughs> Anybody wanna uh, take a guess? No, no. Star Trek. Star Trek. There you go. What is it? Uh, Someone tricorder. said it. Tricorder, right. So what could you do with a tricorder? You're, you're geeky. Cool. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> what, what can you do with a tricorder? Uh, you can figure out what's wrong with people. Okay, and how do you do that? You scan them, right? <laughs> Amazing, right? So that's the future of healthcare, okay? And um, just imagine you know, getting to a point where maybe you don't need your stethoscope. There's a, there's a cardiologist, Eric Topol, who I had the opportunity to meet last year. And on stage, in front of thousands of family physicians, he pulled out a mobile device, he put some gel on a little probe, opened up his shirt a little bit, I'm not going to do that, <laughs> placed it on his chest, and up on the screen was his echocardiogram. And what he said was, I'm a cardiologist. I haven't used a stethoscope in three years. Because he said, why listen when I can see? So that's the future, OK? The future is um, you know, patients being able to breathe into their phone 
or uh, record some, something on their device, send that to, to their doctor. The doctor takes that information, writes them back, and maybe we're not doing that face-to-face -face visit every single time, right? Maybe the future of healthcare is somebody sitting in a room with internet through the air and uh, <laughs> talking on one of those tablet things and coaching a patient and saying, so how, how, how's your exercise been? Oh, it's been pretty good. I, I've been working, about a, working out about an hour a day. Liar! <laughs> your device tells me you didn't do that. No, it's not going to be really like that. But, but the idea is there, right? It's the concept. And these things are actually in play right now. There's, there's companies that are working on this. And there's companies that are working on this without doctor input. Okay? Meaning they're trying to figure this out as tech people. They're not engaging with physicians on how to make this better. You guys have a resource here on, uh, and those of you who go to UCI, you have a resource here called The Cove. It's where they bring investors and entrepreneurs and tech people all together. And there's already been some amazing healthcare things that have come out of that. You know, why, not, why aren't we leveraging that? Why aren't we having that conversation? Why aren't we at you know, South by Southwest? Or at, or at uh, the consumer, uh, what is it, Consumer Electric show in, in Vegas? Why aren't doctors there? We should be. We should be having that conversation, right? Because the tricorder is not that far away. So what is innovation? It's not just the shiny flying cars of the future. It's about thinking differently. Okay? And again, I'm not paid by Apple. Um, but, but it is truly about thinking differently. It's about blowing up what we have in, in, in our current world and turning it upside down. So when we converted from paper to EMR in my office, basically what we did is we took paper processes and put them into the EMR world which made for a very inefficient EMR world. Um, and we, we don't have the wherewithal or the understanding on how to break that. So we're employing engineering techniques now. I never knew that I was gonna be a process engineer or an industrial engineer at this point in my life. When my, when my roommate, who's an engineer, was studying that stuff, I was like, Th three units of work for that much work? No way, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be an engineer. But here I am now in my grown-up life doing engineering trying to figure out how to make things more efficient. So this is the challenge I think we have before us. And it's about going from a healthcare industry that innovates or that tolerates innovation, if, if you want to make it kind of snarky, to, one that, to an innovation industry that delivers healthcare. And imagine, if we were able to, to turn healthcare that way, we'd forever be competitive. We'd forever be improving processes to get at the triple aim, right? It's not innovation to make money, it's innovation to make a difference. It's not innovation to buy a pharmaceutical company and then upcharge the medicine. <laughs> it's about how do we make that drug less expensive and better tolerated by patients, right? So that culture of innovation is one that you're gonna find your head beating up against constantly because I live that reality every day. And I, and I hope as you guys get out into the uh, world after training that it'll be easier for you to be innovative because there'll be ways to capture that, ways to vet it, ways to give you time and funding to be able to do those things because all of you have different ideas. And we, and we do innovation every day. When I'm driving on the 405, uh, which is a freeway here for those of you that don't live here, uh, you know, and I see that there's been an accident, or I hear there's been an accident, I adjust my route. That's innovation. That's me saying, taking information that I have, changing my pathway so that I can make, a, make myself be more efficient to get to my workplace on time. You're doing it every day. So how do we make that, how do we scale that up so that it's actually making a difference, not just in the number of Q-tips that we're counting in a room, or cotton balls, but really making a difference in terms of health. You know, people getting more colon cancer screening or you know, uh, people getting vaccinated better. So part of that is delivery, and this is just one model, uh, patient-centered medical home. Um, it's not a physical place that we're building for people, but it's a, co it's a concept that is a way for us to achieve triple aim. And it's about leveraging technology, it's about leveraging and enhancing the patient experience and getting patient input on things. 
and um, reorganizing the way we practice. And so we, we actually have a patient and family advisory committee, and I have patients sitting with me in the room as we're re-engineering things. And we did um, a, a value stream where we looked at um, our efficiency and, and, the, and, the, and the, way, the flow through the office. And the patient said to me, man, if, I, if I'm even one second late, that messes up your guys' whole day, doesn't it? And we're like, yes, it does. <laughs> because it's very complex, uh, the way we deliver care these days. And so how do we simplify that? How do we empower people who are in front of the patient you know, to, uh, to do the right thing for the patient to the highest, of their, to the highest ability of the license? And that's what we're really trying to do with this model. And there are other models that are coming up uh, as we speak. So um, this gets me to um, the workforce issue. And I alluded to this earlier. It's small, it's maldistributed, and it's poorly trained for the future. It's small, it's maldistributed, and it's poorly trained for the future. And the, the training that you're getting is outstanding, no doubt, in that Flexnerian model. Okay? It may not meet the needs of the future in terms of population health. Okay? So your residency faculty across the country have these new milestones that we have to, to meet. And at one of our early meetings reviewing the milestones, I looked around the table with my other faculty and I said, guys, who could pass the milestones right now? Who would score really high? No one dared to raise their hand because none of us were trained in that model of managing a panel, doing population health, those kinds of things. We were trained in dealing with the patient in front of us, taking a history and physical, getting to an assessment and plan, and writing a script. That's what we were trained at. We weren't trained at that higher ecology level of care. So it's, it, it is about the number and distribution, which is, I think, historically how policymakers have thought about workforce. But it's also about training and development. And so um, there's this model that um, Atul Gawande um, wrote about in The New Yorker. And it's about this transition from being cowboys to, be, to, to pick crews. We have a bunch of cowboys right now in the healthcare system, and we need to move to more of a pit crew mentality. Meaning, there needs to be a captain of the pit crew, but we still need to work in teams to be able to provide care for patients. And we're starting to get there, and part of it is that that volume to value proposition is changing. In Medicare, they're changing the way they pay doctors, that it can't just be about cranking out units, of, widgets of care. You actually have to demonstrate some quality, and that, and that bar is gonna be higher and higher by the year 2020. And so groups are scrambling right now to figure out how to provide that higher level of care. So this is my quote. It's eminently tweetable. It's 140 characters or less. <laughs> Just a hint, in case you're looking down at your phone. Become the physician you wrote about in your personal statement. Okay? It is your vision statement. It is your superhero origin story. It's going to guide you because there are going to be hard times because change is hard. And when, when you're confronted with one of those hard times, look at your personal statement. Pull it out, look at it, review it with someone else, and, and, and ask yourself, are my values still the same? Am I, align, am I lining up with what I wrote about when I, when I first started this journey? And if your, question, if your answer is, I got, I've gone way off base, ask yourself why. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Maybe you, you came in thinking that you'd be the, a world-renowned create, you know, creatine kinase expert, right? <laughs> um, and, then, and then what you realize is, I, I really like people. <laughs> and I want to care for people, right? Um, so, but use it as, as, a, as a guide, because those hard times are going to come, and that's a recipe for burnout if you don't know where to go. You really want to be able to go and talk with people and, um, and be able to share your story and have some people that you can, you can confide in. And uh, I would say start with sharing your personal statement. So um, I've got a few more minutes left. And what I wanted to do is kind of highlight this, which is we're really talking about ecology now. And we're talking about populations because that's where we can make a difference. And that's where these integrated, vertically integrated, horizontally integrated systems of care are really gonna make a difference because they've, they have the, 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 the size, if you will, to be able to collect data, to act on that data, and to put in processes that are gonna help improve health over time. 
Use an individual, maybe that guy who writes healthcare for all on your chest, but you need a bunch of people who've written healthcare for all to sort of make a difference, right? And so as we start to think more about that ecology, I want, to think, I want you guys to think about when you're with an individual patient, think about where that patient lives and think about the environment where they are and think about how you can make a difference for them. It may not be in the traditional way you think in terms of writing a prescription or putting on a splint or anything like that. It's probably going to be a lot deeper and harder than that. So I want to challenge you to think about that and, and to, to put yourself outside um, the four walls of your clinic uh, to make that difference. So I believe this is one of the final uh, slides. Um, but to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And again, we are in that era right now where um, the traditional 15-minute face-to-face visit as the currency for how we deliver care or the, you know, the three-day hospital stay for X, Y, and Z, that currency is going to go away. It's going to be redefined. And we're going to get to that era of the tricorder. We're going to get to that era of the, um, you know, the telemedicine visit. But it's going to require intentionality. And it's going to require people to be at the table to say, no, 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 no. The change that you're making is not going to be very patient-centered. Isn't that right, patient? Because the patient's at the table, too. OK? So um, the intersections in healthcare, um, it's, it's fascinating because uh, I've, I've actually reunited with people I haven't seen in 15 years, in some cases, um, at this meeting. Um, or people that I met 15 years ago, and in some cases, people that I met in seventh or eighth grade at camp, uh, who I've reconnected in, in, in my adult life. What you're doing right here by coming together on a Saturday and getting all dressed up to come to a, a big meeting is you're finding community. Okay? Look around. This is the community that you're going to have to sort of help support you in, in your vision and in, in achieving that greater vision. It's, it's not going to happen just because you did it yourself. It's going, to be ha it's going to happen because you had a community around you, supporting you, loving you, embracing you. Um, and and in, in a community where you, you feel OK with being vulnerable. Vulnerability is actually a great strength. The ability to show that publicly or privately is actually a, 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 a huge strength. And it's, it's the one strength that I see in leaders. They have vision. And they have the ability to, to show that they're vulnerable. The vision means that they know how to think big. And they know how to have a good time. <laughs> um, and, the, and, the, and that vulnerability is that they're human. That this is somebody that I can actually follow. It's not somebody who's superhuman. right? So vision and vulnerability. And, and that's really where community is important. So I want to give a shout out to the committee for putting together an outstanding program today. Um, including, um, you know, the Surgeon General of the United States. Pretty awesome. Nice job. Um, but I also want to point out that everyone here on, this, on, the, on the program today is outstanding. And they bring a ton of wisdom and experience and humor and goodwill in coming to spend their Saturday with you. And um, I know that you're going to have a wonderful meeting. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing all the tweets that are out there using the hashtag UCI or PAMSA 2015, uh, because because I have to leave a little bit later on to go up to San Francisco for a retirement dinner uh, for Tom Bodenheimer, who's a guru at UCSF. Um, he's sort of semi-retiring. He's he's not he's kind of half retiring, but um, but they're having a gala for him. In any event, um, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing um, how, how the rest of this meeting goes. Um, and this is the way to contact me. I have a lot of different ways of, of contacting me through social media, through email. I even have my mobile phone. I'm text friendly. Don't all text me at the same time, please. Um, but if you, if you need someone to talk to or you need help in, in getting connected to somebody who can help you, reach out to me. I, I do a lot of inf informal mentoring. And uh, again, it was a real honor and a pleasure uh, to be here 15 years after the fact, uh, to, to be all grown up. And, to be able to come back here, it's, it truly is a, is a joy. And uh, thank you again for your attention in this incredibly warm room. Thank you. <laughs>